Hello everybody, welcome to our session today. I'm Katrina O'Neill. I am uh, the Director of Community Services and Lymphedema at Accelerate, so I'm delighted for you to join us today. Uh, during the session, please use the question and answer faci um, facility or in the live chat. If you've got any questions, we'll aim to answer some as we go along, and there'll also be an opportunity at the end to answer some questions. And I'll hand over to Matt to introduce himself. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Matt. I'm a senior lymphedema practitioner working with uh, Katrina here. Um, for me, my main focus in all of this is, uh, is getting people to look after themselves. So uh, hopefully enjoy the, the video and, and as Katrina says, any questions, put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A and we'll try and answer what we can. Ah, lovely. Hi Matt, how are you? Not too bad. Yourself Katrina? I'm good, I'm good. So looking forward to this chat today. Yes. Um, Matt, in kind of simple terms, when we look at lymphedema, some people have like an intrinsic fault to the, the drainage system, and we'd refer to that as primary lymphedema. Yeah. Most other causes of swelling are secondary to either damage or overload, or maybe a combination of both. But it is a long-term condition, and it can be challenging for people to live with. And I just wondered some of the lessons that you've learned over this last while, well, me, uh, what are the key areas really that you focus on, particularly with new people that are diagnosed? Okay, and how well, do you help them to manage their condition? Right, right. Well, for me, um, I think I think sometimes a first assessment is can be quite overwhelming for for a lot of the, the yeah. Sorry, a lot of the people we see. There's a huge amount of information very often spending quite a number of years yeah. even finding a diagnosis. So that first review is really, really important to, to have a chance to break down exactly what was said, make sure they yeah. understand what's going on, make sure they understand it's lifelong, giving them um, any information they might be able to find, whether it's uh, information leaflets or online places or, or groups that they can join in with and discuss their their condition and, and make sure generally there's just a proper understanding of what this means okay as a clinician I think it's it's uh, it's also understanding their priorities what is the individual mm. person's priorities yeah, absolutely you know, what do they want to achieve with this so um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's it's really it's it's impossible to treat anyone with chronic edema without seeing them as a whole you know where their priorities lie what's going on in their, in their own health and their own home life and, and you need to have a full understanding uh, of everything now um and basically uh, of course we all have quite complex patients from time to time um often with a with quite a few extra comorbidities going on and we often see people as well where their treatment should be really quite straightforward and for some reason they're not able to self-manage or, or at least it seems that way you know um so i think it's really that definitely resonates with me Matt. yeah exactly yeah. it's uh it's it's sometimes it's something that we're missing you know what are we missing about this person and my my key focus with anyone i see is how can i enable this person to manage their own condition, mm -hmm. right? And you you have to work in partnership with anyone you see, otherwise there, you know, there's no way forward. You, you need to work out that what methods work for them best. Absolutely, and that's a real skill, Matt, isn't it? I mean, how do you personally sort of approach those key areas of treatment with people? Well, I, I tend to break it down into, into three sort of main areas, um, and, and again, now, I know clinicians up and down the lab will, uh, will not like me for saying it. I, I don't see it as a, a hugely complicated thing. I always tend to break it down into clean, compress, and exercise. Uh, and uh, and a, a few of you keep calling it the map mantra, but it's those three. Yeah, yeah, well, it has <laughs> um, been known to be called that. <laughs> exactly, and uh, and everyone I see has got exactly the same three three sort of categories. How everyone achieves those jobs is what makes sure everyone so different. Mm. You know? And that's where you have to really work it out together, almost be a bit of a detective to find out what is working for them. 
everyone's a little bit of a guinea pig sometimes with it all. So um, obviously as well, if, if they're not on board with you, this is a condition where you're not going to achieve anything. You, you have to work in partnership. Mm -hmm. um, some of the barriers might be things like psychological or physical barriers, and they need to, to be addressed pretty much from the outset, or as soon as you see them anyway. So um, maybe they need help from other dis disciplines. You know, maybe they do need help from psychology. Maybe it's physiotherapy. Maybe it's uh, the district nursery teams or, or, or a whole manner of different other teams that you can, you can work with. And we can't forget for one second the massive role that friends and family play within the care of that individual as well. So it's, it's how do we get this team together to help the individual help themselves. Mm. And I, I would always say that no matter what help anyone may or may not need, the individual with the edema has <laughs> the biggest me. part to play. They have got the main job and everyone else is the cheerleaders around them, getting them to do that job. It's a really good description, so, Matt. Yeah. You know, we, 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 need, we need them on board in every way and wherever possible. In my mind, I'm always thinking, what makes them independent? Or at least how can I continue to push them forwards to more and more independence with it? So, Matt, I want to talk through the different steps just to break them down a bit more and, you know, sure. really for us and the audience to <laughs> work through the Matt mantra. Um, so could you talk me through the first step, clean, in your sure. mantra? Thank you. Sure. So clean, um, uh, again, little umbrella terms, but clean is all about skincare. So um, it's it's really essential for good skincare to make sure that uh, we in, we maintain as much integrity of the skin as possible. Um, whether that's the nails, the feet, you know, and anywhere on the leg, are we maintaining it as best as possible? Try and minimize any entry points for infections if we can, you know, obviously cellulitis rings a bell for many of us, but how can we reduce that as best as possible? With skincare, I'd say uh, it's, it's quite common to see a, a buildup of excess skin. And it's important to reduce this wherever possible. This, uh, with the build up there, it makes it far more likely for infections, far more likely for skin breaks. And, and obviously we can't forget mm -hmm. that a lot of people become really quite self-conscious of what they can see on their legs. And, and it makes them uh, shy away from, from wanting to go out, from showing their legs, from dealing with it. So, you know, it becomes an embarrassment and it shouldn't be. Um, I agree. For, for me, that this, it's, it's not, again, it's quite simple. If you have excess skin, it's just a case of cleaning it properly. And a lot of people, quite, quite understandably, become really gentle with their skin. They don't want the bleeding. They don't want the skin breaks. And, and of course they don't. But the moment they start being gentle is the moment they stop exfoliating. All right, and they don't need any special products. You don't need to go out and buy anything rough. You don't have to go tough with it. You just need to soak them and wash them how you always did your entire life. Just in the shower, in the bath, in the bucket if you have to. Use your hands, use a flannel. Just stop being uh, too careful and treat them normally. And, and, and that, it should, it should easily get rid of any excess skin. Obviously, some people will find it quite difficult to wash themselves. And, and for me, that starts to ring, how do we find the method for this individual? Mm. Why can't they wash themselves? Is it because, um, you know, it, it, is it as simple as, excuse me, yeah? is it a balance issue? You know, would that be sorted by just putting a chair in the shower room? You know, is it because they can't bend? Okay, well then, can that be sorted with like a, a loofer on a stick or, or a, you know, a, I've even had a patient in the past buy a mop to do the job. It wouldn't have been my go-to product, but if it worked for them, why not? Um, so again, that means they can be independent. They can keep themselves clean. Mm -hmm. I would also start to think, why can't they bend? What is it about this individual that makes it hard? So is it worth me going down the physiotherapy route and, and referring to them because if they can improve their mobility over time as well then why not yeah, um, yeah. it's important to keep moisturized 
and and there are obviously hundreds of products out there that we could potentially pick from so those clinicians will tend to go to a few few sort of main ones that we like and that's fine um the main purpose with any of these skincare creams is basically to uh, reduce cracking apply a little bit of flexibility it's not going to do the repair for you it's just going to going to stop that constant cracking as easily if you're not washing off the the excess skin though it's just going to sit on the top it's not going to get to the to the good skin underneath so again washing it properly and creaming with whichever one you you, you ended up using under clean as well as a final thing, I'd also put things like taking care of any skin breaks, any wounds you've got, keeping them clean, keeping them dry where you can, covering them over. And, and quite commonly, we'll see things like athlete's foot as well. Why allow an extra entry point for something that is usually quite simple to clear up with an over-the-counter cream or spray? So this is all comes under my little clean part of the first part of the mantra. Yeah, it's those other things, isn't it? Athletes, foot, heart, skin, nail care. All yeah. of that is essential when we think of not just our lower limbs, it's the whole skin component. Exactly. And then Matt, then your step two, um, <laughs> compress. So talk yeah. us through the, the, the next step in the Matt mantra. So compression. Um, obviously, the, uh, there's two sort of main ways we, we tend to do this. First off is bandaging. Mm -hmm. And usually we'll do bandaging if we're trying to reduce volume right, of a, of a limb or are we trying to improve the skin and they, they're not leaking or anything like that. Um, so, so that's usually where we go to with this. And then everything else comes under an absolutely overwhelmingly array of, of compression garments that are out there. There is a huge, huge variety. And... And a lot of people in the industry have worked really hard over many years to give quite a lot of options, colours, patterns, styles, materials. So there, there is plenty out there. And, uh, and they're the two main ways we really compress. For ourselves, um, well, for me at the very least anyway, when I'm looking at garments, I, I'll, I'll try and work backwards. I'll go, well, what, what would I like to give this person to do the best possible job? And then... <laughs> what can I actually give this person based on what they can achieve and what they would prefer in terms of material, what can they tolerate, what keeps them independent? So how much compression can I give them? Um, have they had any experience of compression before? You know, so good or bad, is it something? Hmm. Can we need applicators? You know, I would say everyone should use an applicator because why fight the, with the garment anyway? They're not supposed to be easy necessarily to put on. Um, but what kind of applicator? You know, can we practice with them? Can they can they get a handle on that one? They're, they're, again, huge variety of, of different ones they could be using now. Um, and then obviously we got styles, and we've got uh, you know what would fit in with their their normal wardrobe. It's not always <laughs> exactly a huge, huge array of variety again there, but in certain products, there, there is obviously less choice. Um, and sometimes uh, we need to start with these kind of products to avoid any rubbing, any pinching of garments. Uh, are we still aiming for reduction first? So for me, it's also important to try and persuade the person I'm seeing at the time to can you live with this one short term while you're improving if you continue to improve with skincare with reject, reduction in volume then the world tends to open up to you there are many more options the smaller and, uh, and for lack of a better way of putting it more normal a leg shaped leg is um, there, there is a huge variety out there but we sometimes have to start with something you know let's see what it's like again in mm -hmm. a few months all right sometimes it's in combination sometimes you can get away with things maybe maybe someone might be in a particularly tougher product but you can get away with this in the uh, uh, you know very low compression over the top that makes it look entirely different and makes them feel very different about it so again everyone's a little bit of a guinea pig mm. Mm. So, so to the same principle isn't it about it's the priorities what's needed therapeutically 
but also what sits well with the person having to wear yeah. wear the compression it's as well. exactly a, a perfect example of, of that with someone who you know and i'm sure we've all seen many people where they go i can't wear this i'm, I'm you know, I've got a wedding in three weeks I want to go to. I say, well, that's, that's okay. You know, it's okay. Let's give you this one that's going to do the job we want um, and achieve the results you, you want there. But then, look, here's this one product you can use for this time. Be careful of this, 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 and this, right, um, to make sure it doesn't cause any problems. But you can use that for that one day. Then get back on the rest of, of the mm. sort of treatment as, as you want. You know, something to maintain it for that one day. And that's okay. They're happy happy with that and obviously when um, any garments you give anyone you then have to go how you look after the garment mm. you know mm. how do you get it on yeah how, do, how you... do you Matthew <laughs> <laughs> there, well there's plenty of ways it depends on the individual manufacturer obviously but you know there will be certain ways to keep them clean certain ways to wear them can you wear creams with them um, you know, definitely none of them I've seen you should put in tumble dryers or anything like that. So how do you best care for the product so that the product best cares for you until you need the next one? I mean, the general principle nowadays, the majority on the whole can be machine washed, can't they nowadays? Oh, There's been a sort absolutely. of a shift, 40 degrees, no oh, fabric yeah. softener, or as we say, no direct heat. Exactly. Um, you know they're, they're sort of the general principles and uh, they, they usually brings a smile to people's faces as well when they realize they go, i don't have to hand wash it's, no it's okay it's okay you can put it yeah yeah that's a sort of industry has done a lot sort of to facilitate that for us as well and i think the only other thing matt i suppose for our clinicians out there it's just really been clear with the patient yeah. and the clinicians that the agreed plan isn't around wear times because it will vary of course oh, sure. depending on therapeutic need and uh yeah. That needs to be very clear so that there's no harm and stockings aren't worn or garments aren't worn overnight incorrectly in some cases. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, and, and again, if if you cannot achieve exactly what you want in, in one go, that's okay. You know, if, if someone can't tolerate a garment all day potentially, can they tolerate an hour? If they can, maybe next week they can tolerate two hours. Maybe they can tolerate three. It's how do you build up? What, whatever the start point is, how do you build that up over time? And I think my big take home as a clinician is that as good as we can be as specialists, um, we try and get it, the correct one married up with the patient's needs most of the time. But sometimes it is a work in progress to get that ideal optimum therapeutic and yeah. all the other things that you've considered as well. So that leads us nicely on to your step three, Matt, in your right. answer. And you talk about um, understanding exercise, and it's like such a really appropriate for our general well-being, weight management, and how does that really relate to lymphedema? So, for for me, exercise is the is the most important part of all of this. Um, it's it's one of the main mechanisms. Every time we move our muscles, it's one of the main things that will propel blood and lymph around the body. All right, so this is this is vital in terms of management and keeping the edema uh, as minimal as possible. So without it, you're far more likely to obviously develop chronic edema. You're far more likely for, for other complications with it all. And as the mobility gets worse and worse, mm -hmm. again, that's just exacerbated. And we've all started to, to see more and more people because we are all more sedentary than we used to be you know, a few generations ago. So far more desk based work and things like that. And, um, and of course, see, should we say the dreaded COVID-19 has yes. had a, a massive impact and there's much more focus, isn't there, in the media oh, about yeah. our sedentary lifestyle as well? Oh, definitely, definitely. It has, it has put a, a, a spotlight let's say, on, on, on yeah, how to deal with yeah. this. And, and for me, though, and, and also an opportunity, um, because as much as this has really got in the way for lots of people, it's, it's also another thing to say, you don't need to go outside for exercise. You don't need the gym for exercise. You don't need this. And, and yes, okay, during lockdown times and that, you still, your body's not waiting for when it's nice and warm and sunny and everything. What can you do now? All right, so it, it was able to highlight some of that. Um, 
and that that's the thing a lot of people will have that instant fear in their eyes of when i when, when i mention an exercise and, and they go oh, oh okay um right what, what does that mean and i said well it doesn't have to be uh it's, excuse me <laughs> so the, you often get the same sort of responses of well i can't go to the gym um, i'm too busy doing housework can't lift my legs they're too heavy um, or I go for you know some people I go for a walk once a week when I'm doing the shopping you go it's okay you go it doesn't have to be complicated it really really doesn't there is nothing to to be feared about exercise and it can be tailored to every single person the most important part is you're trying to promote Venus return the compression garments you, you use will not be particularly effective without the exercise. They are brilliant products, mm. but basically they're trying to replicate a very large and very effective valve on the outside of the leg. But there's not much point in the valve if the engine's not on. You know, so you you need to need to actually do the activity. General principle. Greater the the job you give any muscle, the greater the contraction of the muscle, the greater the pump. Now that doesn't mean I'm talking about the difference between walking and running, but it could be as simple as we sit on the sofa, pointing our toes up and down. Okay, it's exactly the same action if we're standing uh, at the sink, standing on tiptoes, but we've added body weight, so it's a greater resistance, greater pump. Okay, so. I'll often say to people, okay, tiptoes before tea. So up and down five or six times or something while they're waiting for the kettle to boil. That's fine. That, 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 that's okay. It's about little and ridiculously often where, where possible to continue that promotion. Um, the bigger activities, whether they be swimming or cycling and everything, will never replace the little but often. They're bonus extra to that strength stamina and of course venous return lymph return but they're the extra bits okay um edema is not going to wait for again like we said with the, with the covid sort of restrictions it's not going to wait for the weekly walk with the shop it's not going to wait until the pandemic gets over um and it won't wait for those individuals that might have a, a bad day with their knee so you have to go how do you get around this obstacle you're still the guinea pig how do you find uh, a pathway is it that today is a bad day for your knees so okay you better do twice as much exercise sat in the chair today okay is it that you can't go outside for the walk like you wanted to because it's raining or can you go up and down the stairs five or six times instead you know if you can't add as much resistance as you as you would like if you can't stand up and down on your tiptoes can you just push your feet into a cushion and add resistance more than just in the air. So it's all these little bits that you're trying to add little over time, all right? You're not going to do it all in one day, but if it's more today than it was yesterday, then it's in the right direction. Really, it's all about promoting, isn't it? Exercise as key to sort of the better long-term outcomes for, for the people that we treat and the clinicians and getting over those obstacles and uh, yeah. encouraging ongoing exercise. Oh, definitely, definitely. And again, that shows as well that the, the patient, the individual person you're seeing um, has the biggest job. No one's gonna pump the muscles for them. They have to do that. They might need some assistance early on with, uh, with garments and, and things like that, but they need to actually do the job. Once it's on, it's up to, it's up to them. Um, I would go, uh, go on with, I would go on with that though as well in the sense that if, if something is hard for them for, for any individual to do, what can we do to work on that? Mm -hmm. uh, again, do we need input from outside? So let's say for instance, they struggle with independence just to, 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 to get the sock on and we give them applicators. Well, why are they struggling to put that on? Is it as simple as they don't have the grip strength? okay well our focus is the legs but why can't we give them hand strength in exercises so that their grip strength improves and they become more independent with that over time so again we have to look at them as a whole what is the obstacle yeah and that um so just really just to get to the sort of summary when we look at weight management 
what part does that play in lymphedema management would you say well there's a uh... <laughs> Weight management is obviously uh, it impacts on many areas of health, um, including chronic edema. Okay, um, it's very often not the main reason why it might have started in someone, but it can be one of the main obstacles for improvement. Okay, uh, if if they're if they're overweight, then again, there, there's definitely going to be some uh, self-conscious or, or issues with their own well-being. So the more exercise they do, the more likely you are to tackle those feelings and those insecurities. The pressure you'll take off of your own, own body in terms of movement and finding exercise easier over time. And, uh, and obviously in some cases, the, that will help with edema flow as well. But weight management, uh, again, it needs, to be in, it needs to be tailored to the individual. All right, mm -hmm. they have to take ownership of this and realize that, that losing weight will have a whole, a whole host of benefits mm -hmm. um, and may also help with their edema. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's part of making it a, a goal. All right, the more exercise they can do over time, the more likely that they'll start to, to be able to reduce weight with their activity. I would far rather people up their activity than just drop calories. All right. Yeah. Everyone's tried diets before, myself included. Uh, and yeah, the, if, if it was an easy job to do, we wouldn't have multi-billion dollar industries around it. And I but would it, agree with that. I mean, often our approach is about stabilising, isn't it, as well? Okay. And simple steps. Stabilising where we're at with it and really focusing on the exercise, which will yeah. lead to weight loss, a feeling of well-being. Exactly. Can we stop yeah. adding to the pot before, you know, before we were look at reducing it? So definitely. Yeah. So Matt, we're just coming to the end, really, just sort of, just in summary, really. We've covered quite a lot today. <laughs> and what would sort of be the key advice that you would leave us with at the end of the day, really? So key advice for me is, again, it, you have to see every person um, as, mm. uh, as, as a whole. And, and a whole puzzle, let's say. Yes, clean, compress, exercise. That's it. How are they going to achieve those jobs? All right, and work with them. They have to be in partnership. And, uh, and as a clinician, I think the most, uh, most important thing we can identify with as well is, remember that you're, you're not gonna do it all. All right, there are limitations on what we can achieve ourselves. So there's no shame in asking for help or asking for another angle. Sometimes it can be the most simple thing that someone needs assistance with and that switch goes off and they're ready. And that's okay, that's okay. But we need to find how this person can be independent. Because the ultimate goal for me and hopefully for everyone I see is that one day, all it is is a pair of socks. Put them on, get on with your day, be active. Oh, thank you, Matt. It's really lovely to, to chat to you today. We, I think we could talk all day, really, about this subject. I know. We're, we're going to have to wrap up now, and we're just about to go into the live lounge where we'll take some questions. Okay. And we may not be able to address any question, all questions today, but hopefully we'll get through some of the key questions. And thanks very much, um, okay. and thanks for joining us. That's okay. All right. Hi everybody. Hello. Um, as we just said, we probably there, there was kind of three main themes that had come through on the chat. So um, we don't have a lot of time because our session was slightly longer than it may have been, should, should have been. But there's three themes there. So I'm just going to sort of generally discuss them. Um, one of them was sort of questions around surgical treatment. So this is a really difficult one. In the UK, the national perspective is that we don't have complete equity of initially of services. And that what we would refer to as the conservative measures, what Matt has talked about, skin care, compression, exercise, stabilizing weight, is the mainstay of treatment. And while there is a small body of evidence for surgical interventions, in the UK, they're not on the NHS. Now, I raised this question last year at conference to who I call the guru of lymphedema, um, a consultant many of us know, Professor Mortimer. 
And he explained it quite nicely to me in that I was interested to see in the future where with lymphedema would we be going with surgery or where there's further research with medication. And I suppose with the lymphatic system, there's so much that we don't know. Isn't that right, Matt? There is this, there's so much that needs to be learned about this system. There is research going on around medication. Are some of us more leaky? Do some of us have additional you know, lymph nodes, different pathways? Surgical interventions are happening. They're not available on the NHS in the UK at the moment. That's not to say in the future it may change. So, um, but the mainstay of treatment he was very clear on is it, the conservative elements will always be the mainstay. Now there's been specific questions about recommendations. It, that's not something that I would be uh, recommending here online, but I'm very happy for anyone to contact us directly at Accelerate or through Legs Matters if you needed any further guidance. Um, was, there, Matt, was there anything specifically you wanted to add to that? Is it, no, it's well, uh, it, that in particular, I, I would say that if there is surgical treatment that you can have and, uh, and as that improves, that doesn't for one second take away from the conservative side of treatment. Because the, the, I suppose the more prepared, the healthier, the stronger you go into any of these kind of things as well, the quicker the recovery, the better the outcome. So if you can do all you can conservatively prior to that, then why not? And I think that leads me on to the other theme. I suppose it was a question around hosiery. Does it have to be made to measure and bespoke? Well, it really comes down to having an assessment and what you need clinically. And you, you've answered that, Matt. But it's also about services and access. There's different models, different services. You, you, I've directed to the, uh, the British Lymphology Society. They've got a directory. The Lymphedema Support Network are really good support. And again, we're happy for you to reach out if there's any specific issues that we can signpost to. But it does come down to equity, equity of services. So you get a good assessment and have what's required. And I think I would just go back to what you said, Matt. Industry has done fantastic for us, but there are so many options and sometimes people give up a little and yeah. it's not an exact science. We try as professionals, we pride ourselves that we're very good at measuring, but it is, you know, it has to be right for the person, doesn't it? As you said, you said up there as well. And um, I think we've got time for one more question, otherwise it was, we'll this session. <laughs> <laughs> there was one that I saw that did come up, which I, which I think goes into yeah. what I was saying earlier with the video is that, um, uh, someone asked the question about how can we get uh, services to take this more seriously and, and they take a day off work a week just for exercise and they exercise when they get home. And for me, this, this again highlights what we're saying is you don't have to wait till you get home to exercise. You don't have to wait and take that day off for it. If you Absolutely. want to do the bigger activity, like cycling, running, swimming, whatever you want, that's fine. Why can't you exercise at work? What stops you, for instance, doing a, a, every time you send an email, you do a couple of can-can impressions under the desk. What stops you when you get a coffee doing a few tiptoes while you're there? You know, so I think, yeah. it can so be anywhere. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that's come out of COVID, isn't it? I think as professionals sitting at home, working at home, whether you're a person, a patient, a family member, everyone has become so much more aware how inactivity doesn't sit well with us. It's, it's not good for us. No. Uh, so that's one positive thing we can take from C19. Um, the big question, again, I won't have too long to go into it, was wet legs, okay. So many people with long-term swelling that is unmanaged may have leaky legs. There's obviously complexity with that. I would say as a person, as a patient, you should expect a good prompt you know, this is what uh, Legs Matters is about. You need to expect a good, thorough assessment with prompt treatment. Clinicians, you need to be able to facilitate that because it puts people in harm's way at risk of infections. And really the principles are the conservative measures, the skincare, good compression to resolve the leaky legs. And we see this all too, too often, really. Um, and it's not very pleasant for a patient's Matt, is it, when we see that? And I know you've had miraculous results. Patients come in and we call compression the magic treatment one, two days. You know, it can be resolved with very good, consistent care. Yeah, yeah. 
there, there was one there was one final one I think might be worth um, addressing that just popped up now a question with regards to what if the the GP doesn't recognize the condition or something then then of course this is an area that, this is part of what we're trying to tackle with legs matter week more information more knowledge up and down the country if they really have a question over it um, even if it's out of area I don't see why you can't for instance, uh, post to one of the many services, including our own, to to prompt that information or see if there is another service in your area. You know, the more Absolutely. knowledge it's out there, the better. And this is what we want. We want recognition. We want the public, people, clinicians to demand prompt assessment, effective treatment, and to have this recognition. And we, we see this quite often. Um, it's why we're passionate about what we do. We don't want to see that for people. But anyway, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Otherwise, I said we'll be kicked out. What I will say is if there's any outstanding questions, please contact Legs Matters or feel free to come through to Accelerate Chat. Also happy to answer any questions there. Um, and I would just say thank you very much um, for joining us today um, and some really good questions. And thank you, Matt. No problem. Thank you. Green, Thanks, press, exercise. The mantra. Take care. Bye.